Perfect. Thank you so much, Larry, for that introduction. Now I'm going to be kind of self-conscious about how loud my voice is, but here we go. So thank you all so much for being here. It's so nice doing this in person again. It was uh, getting kind of tired uh, yelling at my laptop during talks, so now it's nice to actually just yell at people again. So that's exciting. So the topic of this talk is going to be understanding and enjoying bird migration and lights out Cleveland. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of what is lights out Cleveland, we're going to go over how birds migrate and how we understand the phenomenon of bird migration. After that, we're going to get into how lights out Cleveland works, some results from the project thus far, and how you can get involved. So with that, let's go for it. So songbird migration mostly happens at night. And why would that be? It's a rhetorical question, I'll answer it for you. So at night, <laughs> there are cooler temperatures, the air is less turbulent, there are fewer predators, and if you're migrating at night, that means during the day you have a chance to feed and rest and refuel, and birds navigate at night. So there are three main ways in which birds can orient themselves on the planet and navigate. The first one being stars. So birds are hatched, they're born with the innate ability to read the stars like a map. And they can orient themselves on the globe based on the position of the stars and the moon. Birds also have the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic fields, another thing that us mere mammals cannot do. And again, they use this to orient themselves on the globe and to navigate during migration. And thirdly, birds have the ability to see patterns of polarized light. And again, that helps them orient themselves on the planet and helps them navigate. And a lot of how we understand these three phenomenon is by studying homing pigeons. And so if you know how homing pigeons work, if you take a pigeon away from where it's from, put a little note on its ankle if you feel like it, and release it, it will go right back to where it came from. And so for a long time, humans have known that birds have the ability to find themselves on the globe and navigate in a specific direction to get to a specific destination. So which one is the most important? So although all of the pieces, parts of how migration works, it's not fully understood yet, but we do know that the order in which these are listed, that is the order of importance for birds and bird migration. And how accurate is this orientation? The answer is extremely accurate. <laughs> so studies using banded ruby-throated hummingbirds, a bird that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, have shown that these birds will show up to the exact same nectar feeders year after year. So this bird that weighs about as much as a nickel flies over the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, wait, I've got a pointer flies over the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> in a non-stop 18 to 22 hour flight, non-stop. These birds are not built for water, huge shock, so they cannot stop once they start that flight over the Gulf of Mexico. So that tiny little bird flies over the Gulf of Mexico and makes its way back to the exact same nectar feeders year after year. So this is an incredibly accurate system of navigation. So not only are they using celestial clues like the stars and the polarized light, but they also have the ability to recognize uh, topography cues, more localized cues to kind of figure out where they are. So scientists over the past 40 years have used um, NEXRAD weather Doppler surveillance data to more fully understand the movements of migrating birds. And this has really kind of opened the door into bird movement research. And so I'm going to show you some cool videos of uh, what birds look like on weather radar. And so what we're looking at here, this little A, that's where the Doppler station is in Buffalo, New York, right on the tip of Lake Erie. And so what I'm going to show you is um, what's called an evening exodus. But before that, so 
the weather app on your phone has been filtered, like that data is filtered to only show you precipitation. And so that's what precipitation looks like on radar data. It's very familiar, you all know what this looks like. It comes out kind of blacky, kind of an irregular thing. What you're seeing right here, right over the, the radar station in Buffalo, that is a cluster of birds. And so the density of these birds is so, is so high that it's actually picked up by the weather radar. So the scientists use unfiltered raw radar data to more fully understand bird movements. And so birds will start their nightly migrations about 30 to 45 minutes after sundown. And this is what it looks like on the radar. So huge, huge cluster of birds. They're all lifting up into the air, pinging off of those radar stations, taking off for the night to continue their migration. Cool stuff. Here's another cool example of what's called a dawn scramble over Lake Michigan. And so this picture is from 12.48 a.m. And so there's lots of birds moving, but you can see how this donut is starting to form. There's like a yellow ring around the radar data. Birds start to descend on their nightly migrations a little bit after midnight. So you can kind of see that these birds are starting to drop off and they're starting to settle down for the day, start their descent. But at 7.10 a.m., the sun's up. And so all of these birds that are over land, they're starting to come down for the day to rest and refuel and eat. But all of these birds that find themselves over Lake Michigan have a decision to make. Either cross the rest of the lake, which they may not know how much farther they have to go, or scramble back to shore. So that's what you're seeing here is a huge concentration of birds making their way back to land after finding themselves over the lake after sunrise. And so here's some more radar data down on the Gulf Coast. Uh, this is the radar station in Mobile, Alabama. And so you can see around the perimeter here these big blocks, that's actual weather, precipitation happening. And all of this noise down here, that's radar picking up birds that are just hitting land after crossing the Gulf of Mexico. So all of those birds are making landfall after a 22, 18 to 22 hour continuous flight. And so those birds can't stop once the sun comes up. They got to keep going over the Gulf of Mexico. So all day long, that radar data will pick up those birds making landfall. And again, here's another evening exodus out of Mobile. So that's half hour, 45 minutes after sundown. All of those birds that have had a chance to refuel and rest are now taking again to the skies to continue their their migration north. And so here's a map of all of the NextRad Doppler radar stations. So we have really good coverage across continental US to get a really good idea of what's going on with bird movement throughout the migration season. And so on high density migration days, this is what the radar data looks like. All of these little circles are clusters of birds. And now you can see it's not that there's a lack of birds in Columbus. I'm sure there's birds in Columbus. There's got to be. It's just there's no Doppler station in Columbus. So even though it's kind of spotty looking data, you can kind of imagine this is an entire blanket worth of birds traveling all at once. And this is how it shows up on the radar. OK, so how important are the Great Lakes as a stopover site? Spoiler alert, they're really important. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you some really cool videos. Um, this is from the BirdCast lab. And this is um, data that's been compiled over the 40 years of NextRad radar data. Um, and so the intensity of the color clouds is the um, volume of birds. And the arrows that you'll see is the direction that the birds are moving. And so this is spring migration. And so you'll see time will march on. And you can start to see some movement of birds. 
maybe some woodcocks perhaps. Getting into April, migration starts to pick up a little bit. All right, now we're getting into May, end of April, early May. That's when migration really starts to pick up. All those warblers are coming back. All those sparrows are coming back. And keep your eye on the Great Lakes regions. Look at how those arrows are kind of coming right up to and over the Great Lakes region. And then June comes around, migration starts to settle down. Everyone's kind of set up shop for the spring and summer for breeding. Nobody's really moving. Everything's good. So now let's look at fall migration. So now all of those birds that showed up, they all had hopefully one, maybe two clutches of babies. So we've got on the order of a billion more birds moving in the fall, coming back south. All of these baby birds, young of the year, doing their first migration. And again, keep your eye on the Great Lakes region. So early August, it's hummingbirds are starting to get out of Dodge. All right, September starts really kicking into gear. And look at the intensity right over the Great Lakes. So you can see that the birds are utilizing the eastern U.S. flyways much more in the fall. Migration starts to peak in the end of September into October. All the sparrows are starting to move through. And some of the last migrants in the end of November, getting into November, mid-November. And then by the end of November, most of fall migration has finally come to a close. And so using, and I don't know what's going on in Tennessee and Kentucky there. <laughs> some birds are having a party. So all of this data that I've showed you so far, this is looking at a population level. So we just know that all of the birds are moving in this sort of way. You can't really extract any specific information about one species of bird or one individual of bird using radar data. So scientists, in order to more fully understand on an individual level what's going on with bird movement, they've turned to an old technique using radio telemetry to study bird movements. And the technology around radio telemetry has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller to now you can affix a little radio tag onto a beautiful little warbler like this black-throated blue warbler. And it weighs so little that it doesn't impede the bird's flight, doesn't give it any extra burden, just a tiny little backpack. And that's feeding information to these modus towers. So modus is Latin for movement, which I found out about four days ago. Um, and so every time this bird with a little radio tag flies near this modus tower, it will ping that tower and it will either save that data right there at the tower or it will be linked up to someone's email address. And so every time a bird flies over, ping, you get an email and it tells you what bird just flew over your modus tower. And so the use of radio telemetry and modus research has really opened the door even wider into understanding bird migration and bird movements. And so here's a map as of a few days ago of where all of the modus towers are in the, uh, in the whole world. And you can see on the eastern side of the United States there is a lot, a lot, a lot of modus towers. So this is a growing field of study and it's really kind of opening up a whole new world of understanding and how these birds are moving throughout the year. And so I'll show you a quick example of that. And so some great cheek thrushes and some Swainson's thrushes were fixed with a little uh, radio tag backpack on their wintering grounds in Colombia. Because until a few years ago, it was not fully understood where these birds go in the winter and where they go in the spring, like what routes they take back up to their breeding grounds in, uh, in the eastern United States and up into Canada. And so all of the lines that you see here is data from modus tracking. So the orange lines are the Swainson's thrushes, 
the gray lines are the gray cheek thrushes. And you can see these two populations who overwinter in the same country but in different places take completely different migration routes back up north. And that was done using modus tags. So each line represents an individual bird. Pretty cool. And so there's the modus tower that's on top of the museum. So we have a modus tower that picks up a lot of cool bird migration movement. And that's uh, Pat Lorch from the, the Metro Parks who helped uh, install the modus tower on the museum roof. So I just wanted to add this. This is like a brand new study. This was just published. <laughs> this was just published a couple weeks ago. So not all birds are willing participants in this research. <laughs> so magpies, crows, jays are all part of the corvid family, not to be confused with COVID. Um, and they're, they're known for their intellect, their, their social, uh, complex social structures, and their familial bonds. So when these Australian researchers uh, put little radio tags on these Australian magpies. They said, no, thank you. And they all took turns taking the little backpacks off of each other. And so those researchers will have to figure out a different way to study the movements of those magpies. They're very cool birds. <laughs> okay, so now let's get into how Lights Out Cleveland works. Now that we've got to kind of have a, a background in Migration 101, we can get into the, the nitty gritty and the, the actual title of this talk. And so again, let's think about the ways that birds orient themselves on the planet and the tools that they use to, to navigate themselves throughout migration. And now think about what happens when a migrating bird encounters a city at night. So we're going to use a very dramatic example to kind of get this point across. So here is the 9-11 the Memorial and Museum tribute lights. Um, they do the, do the tribute lights on September 11th every year since the, I think, 2005 they started doing that. Um, and ornithologists and birders alike quickly found out that this is causing some pretty serious problems uh, on balls, uh, for birds and fall migration. And so here's a loop video into the beams. So it kind of looks like a bunch of moths. Those are birds. They're disoriented and they're caught in the light beams. Here's some more pictures for, from inside the light beams. So Dr. Andrew Far Farnsworth, he is a senior scientist at Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, he's one of the one of the huge names in studying bird migration and movement. Uh, and he's also associated with New York City Audubon Society. And so he's one of the volunteers that now lay down next to the light beams. And when a threshold is, is met with the amount of birds caught in the beams, they actually turn the lights off for 20 minutes, let the birds reorient and move on, and then they'll turn the lights back off. Um, but the comment that he had, this is from his eBird checklist from that night. And the comment was, over 7,500 warblers, but this is probably 10 to 15,000 shy of a real number. And he said he mostly saw magnolia warblers, black and white warblers, and northern perulas all caught in these lights. And so again, let's, let's look at the radar data to see what's going on. So I, in this graph, you'll see the, the white little circle in the center. That's where the tribute lights are. And you can see there's about 500 birds in a half a kilometer here. We're seeing kind of low numbers, they're kind of evenly spread, but there are a lot of birds moving. And notice the time, it's 10, 12 p.m. This is September 11th, so we're in full swing of fall migration. And so this is what it looks like when the lights are off. Here's what it looks like when the lights are on. So almost 16,000 birds are getting disoriented and caught up in those beams. And it impacts migration of over 160,000 birds in a single night. And so a beautiful tribute is causing a lot of trouble for, for migrating birds. Okay, let's bring it home to Cleveland. So this is a very familiar sight if you live in the Cleveland area. It's cloudy, you can't see the stars. And if you're a bird on migration, this is very, very disorienting. But once you're down into the city, it's not too bad, right? For some stopover, 
habitat. We got some bushes. There's probably some bugs in there. You can hang out and rest. It seems nice. Unfortunately, you're looking at a picture of a mirror. And so these are the types of obstacles that our migrating birds have to deal with once they're caught in our city because they were attracted to our city because of the lights. And again, this is kind of what, what the result of that is. And so in the early 2000s, we had a volunteer named Sue Roman who worked in one of the buildings downtown. And on her lunch break, she would walk around and she'd pick up dead birds. And so we've known this was a, this was a problem. We knew that birds were colliding with buildings downtown. Um, but we really didn't understand the full scope of it. Here's another picture. So we've got some injured some stunned warblers and some dead warblers. And so now we are strategically and methodically collecting data on these bird building collisions. And this, this is a very old problem. Like this isn't an early 2000s problem. This isn't even a 19th century problem. Like any time a human, uh, like there's a, a famous story of a huge fire on a river and it attracted thousands of birds like back before electricity. So this is a very old problem. So if we turn these little Connecticut warblers around, and so these were the, the only specimens of Connecticut warblers we had at the Natural History Museum before Lights Out Cleveland. And you can see these birds collided with Terminal Tower in 1931, and this one in 1934, all around the same exact time. So this is an old problem. And I'm sure a lot of you have, have seen this graph before, have heard about this story that was published in 2019, that since 1970, we've lost almost 3 billion birds. So it's time to start, uh, start caring. <laughs> and so that's what we're trying to do with Lights Out Cleveland. So it's a grassroots, volunteer-fueled coalition with all of these partnering institutions with the main goal of just making Cleveland a safer place for migrating birds to pass through. And so this is far too bright. And for a bird that may be hatched up in northern Canada, this might be the first city they encounter on their first migration down south. And so we've got teams of volunteers that meet before dawn downtown, and they walk routes around major, major routes around the big buildings downtown. And they're picking up injured and dead birds. And these volunteers are, they're incredible. They're sacrificing so many hours of sleep, so many hours walking. One volunteer told me she averages eight miles of walking when she does Lights Out Cleveland in the morning. And so these are incredibly dedicated people, super passionate, led by Tim Jasinski of Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, always in shorts, without fail, no matter how cold it is. Dude doesn't own pants. Um, but if we, could, if we could bottle and sell Tim's energy and enthusiasm, we'd be rich. And if it wasn't for him, Lights Out Cleveland wouldn't be where it is today. But these volunteers, they're walking around downtown, and they're picking up injured birds, they're picking up the dead birds, and they're writing down what building they collided with, what side of the building they collided with, and what time they picked the bird up. So lots and lots of data for each bird. And they've had some really cool encounters, like this gorgeous hooded warbler that they found stunned that was successfully rehabbed and released. And so it's an awesome success story. We love when that happens. OK, so let's get, into the, let's get into the results of all this hard work. So as of 2022, there are 28 buildings signed up with the Lights Out Cleveland program. And these buildings, they promise to turn their lights off during midnight to 6 a.m. during migration, spring and fall. And it's kind of been a snowball effect. The more buildings that sign up, the more other buildings are willing to sign up. And thank you to Brown Stadium for being the very first building to sign up the Lights Out Cleveland program, which I'm happy to say someone was driving downtown the other night and the lights were off at the stadium. So that was, that was very good to hear. And here's another really cool success story. So historically, American woodcocks have fared very poorly in rehab. 
Um, and so with Lights Out Cleveland, we've had opportunities to improve our rehabilitation techniques. And the main problem with woodcocks in rehab is they had issues getting them to eat, and they had issues with them hurting themselves even more once they're in rehab. And so Tim and his team at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center have had plenty of opportunities to work with woodcock. In 2019 alone, 132 of them collided with downtown buildings. And so Tim and his team figured out that these woodcocks would not just take a worm from a dish. They had to actually bury worms in a dog food bowl, fill the enclosure with dirt, put the worms in the dog food bowl, and the woodcocks would feed themselves, and then further just make the, the enclosure look more natural by adding a bunch of dirt and leaves and presenting the food under dirt. And so we can finally get those birds to eat. One of the problems that they had is anytime you'd walk past an enclosure with a woodcock in it, it would scare it and it would shoot straight up like woodcocks do. And so they would get further head injuries in rehab. So Tim and his team figured out they put a cushion on the roof <laughs> and cover all the sides. And what do you know? They've increased their survival rate of woodcock from 35% to 70%. And we're trying to get Tim to publish this in a, in a wildlife rehab journal, just to spread the word. Get more woodcocks out of rehab. Okay, let's talk numbers. And so Lights Out started in fall of 2017. We don't need to talk about 2020. And you can see there, there are still a couple birds that managed to trickle in even with total lockdown happening. But as you can see, just looking at these patterns alone, there's always a huge push of birds in the fall, way more than spring. And unfortunately, for every live bird, there's two or three dead ones. But come the end of spring 2022, we're going to have over 12,000 birds picked up by Lights Out Cleveland volunteers. That's a lot of buds. And so here's a picture of what a very busy day at the rehab looks at. So all those boxes are filled with a bird getting a little TLC, getting some medicine, getting some rest and some food and hopefully get released back out to continue their, their journey north or south. But sometimes we had really bad days. So I'm 26th of October, 2017, which that date is ingrained in mine and my volunteers' minds because we've had to write this date so many times on specimens. There was over 255 collisions in just that one day. Very bad day for birds, and most of these birds are white-throated sparrows. So when we first started Lights Out Cleveland, we figured the volunteers would meet at dawn, walk a route, pick up all the birds, good job, let's go on with the day. But the volunteers quickly found out they'd walk their route, and when they got back to the beginning of their route, there'd be more dead birds. So that's why we have volunteers write down what time of day they pick that bird up, because we quickly found out that the peak collision is well after sunrise. And so there are two issues that these birds are dealing with. One, the lights are drawing them into the city because they're disorienting them. And two, their morning evening movements leave them susceptible to flying into buildings. So it's a one-two punch once you're in the city. And so we have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of dead birds. And so again, we rely on huge effort from a team of very dedicated volunteers. All these volunteers that you see at, the, at this table, not only do they prep specimens with me at the museum, they also walk the routes downtown and pick up the birds too. So we're talking with like high caliber, crazy dedication volunteers. And so, our goal is to process every single Lights Out bird into a research specimen that's permanently housed at the museum. And so with each bird that comes into the museum, we take a spread wing, seen here. We keep the rest of the skeleton, and we take a tissue sample with every single bird. We also weigh the bird. We measure how 
big the wings are, the wing cord from the wrist to the tip of the longest feather, the wingspan. We look in their stomachs to see what they were eating. We describe how much fat the bird had on their body, which is indicative of their overall health. We describe any molts, so if the bird was growing any new feathers. Pretty much anything that stands out to these birds, we write it down and capture it on their little specimen tags, which I brought some specimens here for you guys to look at afterwards. And not only do we keep the bird, we keep all of the hitchhikers that the birds bring too. And so each bird that we prepare, I rough the bird before the process is started, which means I basically just like ruffle up its feathers over a piece of paper. And little mites and lice and hippobosid flies will sometimes fall off of the bird. And we collect all those too, and those go to a researcher at the University of Drexville in Philadelphia. And he studies the bugs that live on birds. We also encounter endoparasites, which are gross, but we save those too. And we actually are now starting to save the entire digestive tract and the eyeballs of every single bird because there's a researcher down at Texas A&M uh, named Kristen Herman, and she studies the parasites that live in the digestive tracts and the eyeballs of birds. Somebody's got to do it, I guess. And so she heard about this incredible data set of birds that we're getting through the museum we're already processing the birds. We're happy to take more data. So out of every bird that we're prepping, we are getting so much rich data from each bird. And that's helping us unlock more questions about birds in general. And so just looking at some of the, the Lights Out Cleveland data, we can see really cool patterns emerge. Like this year-to-year -year difference in eruptive species like red-breasted and white-breasted nuthatch. So in fall 17 and 19, almost no nuthatches came through Lights Out Cleveland. But in 2018, a huge eruption, especially in red-breasted nuthatches. And this is just from playing around with the data for a little bit. And so incredible patterns are, are easily seen. Again, we can use this data to better understand population dynamics and migration timing. So in fall 2017, that was the, the year that we had that really bad day in October with window kills. For all the birds in, 20, in 2017, over a quarter of them were just white-throated sparrows. And this little sliver were all magnolia warblers, and this was everything else. And you can see the difference just one year later in the fall. Way more magnolia warblers and not nearly as many white-throated sparrows. And then just to emphasize the importance of doing daily monitoring throughout the migration season, you can compare weeks. So the last week of October, comparing these two years, almost 270 white throats collided in the last week of October. The following year, only 26. But there was something else that was becoming more and more apparent to us. How come some super common species of birds, like white-throated sparrows, collided all the time, but other super common species, like red-eyed vireo, almost never collide? Like, why is that? And so some of my colleagues had a hunch and published a paper in 2020 exploring that exact question. So what you're seeing in this graph is the collision data against the observation data through eBird records. And so what this graph is showing is, based on how often this bird is being seen by birders, how proportional is that to how often we're finding these birds colliding with buildings? And so the negative residuals, these birds down here, so we've got Eastern Phoebe, Warbling Vireo, uh, Eastern Tohi, Field Sparrow. These birds are seen all the time, but they don't collide with buildings. On the top right of the graph, we call those super colliders. So these are the birds that are colliding at a way higher rate than we would expect based on the abundance 
from eBird records. So we've got oven bird, swamp sparrow, dark-eyed junco, white-throated sparrow, super colliders. And so why would that be? Why would some birds collide with buildings and some don't? With a very simple analysis of marking birds either yes or no, yes, you do make noise during migration, you make flight calls, or no, you don't make any flight calls, a very interesting pattern emerged. So these super colliders, they make flight calls during migration. And so when they're disoriented, they call more. When they call more, they draw more of their species in. And it creates this negative feedback loop that's drawing more birds into a dangerous situation. Where on the other side, these birds aren't making noise and they're not colliding. But this isn't cut and dry. You can see this is yellow warbler and field sparrow. They do make nocturnal flight calls, but they're not colliding with buildings. So this is just a small piece of the puzzle into helping us understand what's really going on with migration. So there's this whole other level of social interaction, social behaviors that these birds are doing on migration beyond the orientation, beyond the genetic drive, but there's also a social aspect and group decision making going on with these birds during migration that we've just yet started to scratch the surface on. All right, so that was pretty doomy and gloomy. Let's bring it, let's bring it back. Let's, let's make it a happy story. So if you think buildings are bad, I don't even want to tell you about cats. The one thing you could do to make a huge impact on bird safety and bird population is for the love of everything holy, keep your cats inside. A good cat is an indoor cat. Please, please, please. Cats are just being cats. They like to kill stuff. It's fine. But, you know, it's the hill I will die on. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can also think, rethink how we light our homes. And so if it's within your ability, it's always best to have downward pointing lights that don't shine light into the, into the sky. Have down, downward pointing lights. Maybe don't griswold it during uh, migration. <laughs> if you have the ability to remove excess artificial light, that would be great. And address problematic windows. So every time I do outreach, there's always stories of, oh, we've got this one window that birds fly into all the time. And I go into my spiel about making your windows a little more safe for our feathered friends. And so now there's lots of different companies that sell different products that can make your windows safer. I do like the cheapest, dirtiest version of this. And I just take a bar of soap and etch a pattern on my window that birds sometimes fly into. But companies sell these cool little adhesive stickers like Kaleidoscape. And the point is it's just breaking up the reflection in your window. And so the bird will perceive that as a solid structure and won't try to fly into the sky or the trees or whatever is being reflected. It thinks it's just flying towards the next habitat to hang out in. So we've got Kaleidoscape, Feather Friendly, those little dots and the little cute toolkit tell you how to put it on your, on your window. Another DIY, making Zen curtains. So this is just pieces of string on the outside of the window, four inches apart. And again, it just breaks up that reflection. You can also buy those online if you don't want to do it yourself. And then some ineffective approaches. So the random falcon sticker does not work. It would work if there were a million of these and they were spaced four inches apart, then they would work. But one little falcon decal is not going to do anything. And this little cardinal sticker really isn't doing anything because it's on the inside of the window. And just one silhouette of a tiny cardinal isn't going to communicate anything to a bird. <clears throat> OK. And you can also support Lights Out Cleveland. You can volunteer in the field, volunteer in the lab, volunteer in the rehab center, help us raise awareness of this program and support our partnering organizations. And with that, I have to thank all of our funding sources. I have to again thank our volunteers and thank our students that have uh, spent summers with us playing around with the data from Lights Out and helping us prep specimens. 
And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you all for hanging out so late. That went on for a long time. I've got study specimens here if you want to take a peek at some of the work I've done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you for your work and your research. And thanks to all your volunteers who make this possible. Yeah.